What does a beautiful future look like to you? You can flip a negative mood on its head. This was a talk that was all over the place, but then New York, you are all over the place. There are experiences that you just don't get anywhere else. Hello, I am Philip Himberg, Executive Director of McDowell, America's oldest artist residency founded in 1907. On behalf of the 92nd Street Y and McDowell, we welcome you to Unique in what I'm sure will be a spirited conversation. I wasn't around in 1907 when Edward and Marion McDowell conceived of what it might mean for art makers to have the space and time and nature in which to ponder and experiment and create. But their vision brought forth a movement, countless enduring works of the imagination, books and plays, paintings, and sculptures and poetry, symphonies and operas and dances and designs of glorious buildings. Thornton Wilder, Leonard Bernstein, Faith Ringgold, James Baldwin, Tahanesi Coates, Audre Lorde, as well as Jacqueline Woodson, who you will soon meet, are but seven over the over 4,000 artists who have been nurtured in the bucolic 450 acres of McDowell in Peterborough, New Hampshire. McDowell is an artist-centered not-for-profit and by definition, an artist residency does not have an audience, yet we are here today as part of a series of public programs to introduce four artists to you and to share a bit about the mystery of how new work is created and specific challenges that artists face. Today's conversation is a partnership with the 92nd Street Y, a New York cultural treasure. My Yiddish-speaking grandmother would call this partnership a shidduch which translates into a match. Whether it is a marriage or not is yet to be determined, but we feel honored to be sharing this virtual platform with the Y, an organization founded in 1874, 33 years before McDowell. We are both legacy, venerable institutions, but much more importantly, we are concerned and passionate about the future. As the world around us shifts in imaginable and unimaginable ways, Artists are the ones who will lead us as they always have. And so it is my great privilege to provide the preface to today's artist panel, which we have entitled Four Women, A Conversation on the Enactment of Identity. It gives me the greatest pleasure to introduce my McDowell colleague, our board chair, Nell Painter. Nell is a distinguished and award-winning scholar and writer and lauded visual artist. Professor Emeritus of American History at Princeton University. Nell is the author of seven books, including the acclaimed The History of White People, which one critic described as one of the most important books ever on the social construction of the notion that there is a white race. Among her other books, Nell has penned a distinguished and unique memoir titled Old in Art School. Dear Nell, Madam Chairman, I turn the stage, or in this case, the screen over to you. Thank you, Philip, and uh, please welcome uh, my fellow conversationalist, um, the distinguished and uh, prominent um, novelist, Jacqueline Woodson. Jacqueline, please just wave, will you? Thank you. Indu Brabessingham, who is in London, who runs her own theater company, and who is a producer and director. Will you wave, please, Indu? Thank you. And Andrea Martin. Andrea is an actor. Andrea, are you in Toronto? I'm in New York. I'm in Manhattan. Okay. All right. Will you please wait too? I will. Thank you. So we know who we are. And uh, we're different artists in this sense that our relationship between our bodies and ourselves and our art, those are all different because, because we make different art. So I wanted to talk today, I wanted you to talk today about the enactment of identity. 
And this conversation started actually when Andrea and Philip and I were talking about how we might shape this. And um, Andrea, you brought up the question of what is interesting in art or what does the audience or what does the producer uh, or what does the publisher consider interesting in art? That's one place to start. But I also want to go over to Jacqueline, who's as a novelist, uh, has had a really wonderful experience. And uh, Jacqueline brought up something that um, is kind of a, a space between the question that I thought of as the marketplace and the producers and the publishers and sales and the question of awards. Awards are not usually paying enough money to make a difference. But Jacqueline reminded me of the difference it can make in reaching your audience. So I'd like her to say some words about that. And for Indu, the question of what does it mean to be in a very visible large minority in a Western country, yet know that you cannot delve deep into the intricacies of one's own personal identity and the identity of the group. So Andrea, would you like to start uh, about what's interesting? What, what's interesting? Mm -hmm. what's in, what, what you have heard about what is interesting to an audience, to a producer, to a show. Oh, oh I see. Um, gosh. Well, you know, I would say in the commercial theater in Broadway, I would say what's interesting to a producer is what's going to sell tickets. I mean, <laughs> you know, I'd like to think it's strictly talent, but I don't um, I don't think that's really the case. It is a business, um, you know, so that's more the commercial theater, more Broadway where everything you know, really matters about how to keep the theater alive, how to pay everybody. Um, so I, I think uh, places where it's more interesting to experiment are places that are not for profit theaters or frankly, play, places where you don't get paid at all. Honestly, uh, that's then then I think there's much more freedom to cast people that are diverse yeah. to um workshop something that might not necessarily a commercial theater would, um, would, uh, uh, you know, take on. So that's kind of the home, I think, for the artists is these nonprofit theaters and workshops. Indu, are you for profit or not for profit? Oh, this is a very interesting question. Um, um, I work in what, what, yeah, we call it subsidized. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, my whole career has been dependent on the subsidized sector that um, I don't think if we were a purely commercial uh, industry that I don't know, you know, my, my provocation to particularly England, whether how diverse would the scene be? Um, but I think the, just to sort of uh, um, question where the interesting space is I don't think it's not that it can't be in the commercial sector mm -hmm. I think it's who's deciding and running the commercial sector so for example in England which the, our commercial sector is what the West End and I'm not speaking for America mm -hmm. I do not know one producer of color or one producer or anybody that is even in a, a senior management position in any of the commercial producer as uh, in 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 this country and so my real provocation to that sector is are you deciding what can sell tickets or what you think can sell tickets and my experience at the kiln theater is that you put on a good story wherever it's from a good story is a good story and people will come and see it so i i have this tension at the moment and a challenge to the commercial sector of who's deciding what work is getting on and what work can sell. So uh, can you make that decision by yourself? No, 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 that's, my, that's the issue, I can't at all. It's really interesting, we've just had our Olivier Awards <clears throat> um, and, the mem and it's voted by the membership of SALT. That, and I we just, just realised, I'm a member of SALT, which is a Society of London Theatre, but I'm an affiliate member because I'm an artistic director of a theatre in London. So I don't have any voting rights. 
I, I, my, again, my challenge to salt um, is I don't think there is any diversity or very little diversity of race in that committee membership. So I'm just sort of saying that that the 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 sector is that there's no there's no um, diversity as far as I'm aware of in uh, in England. Mm -hmm. um, Jacqueline. Your experience, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, has been different from what we might have expect in that I don't think you uh, experienced, at least in a severe way, the kind of gap that Indu was talking about between uh, what uh, is considered uh, marketable and what you want to produce. Did you ever experience that? Um. It's, it's an interesting question because um, in the world, you know, I it, um, live in many worlds, the world of adult literature, the world of children's literature, the world of um, journalism. And I found that in the world of children and young adult literature, there is, um, there is this openness to publish different types of books. Um, back to um, what Indu and Andrea were saying, as long as they sell, it's a business. It's um, and 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 because there's been so much push by organizations like We Need Diverse Books um, and um, diverse authors in general to make publishers publish these books, they are getting out of there, out there. And there's also been this push to recognize them in awards. I mean, a, an award like the Newbery, which is one of the bigger awards in this country, um, for a while it was a black person getting it once every 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that kind of shift, excuse me, shifted because of the push to publish more books by people of color. Um, the publishing houses is still very, very white. So they're still, well, while the bodega doors have seemed to open to let diverse voices in, and I'm not just talking about racially, I'm talking about, you know, in terms of gender, there are more stories about trans writers, there are more stories about queer writers, there are um, more stories from the point of view of indigenous people. There's the whole own voices movement because for a long time in this country, as you know, white folks were telling everybody's story. And then you go to a publishing house and they'd be like, oh, we already have the Indian in the cupboard or something like that. So we don't need another book like that, even though that book was so profoundly racist. So, so, and, and then for me, of course, you know, having won a lot of awards, um, it does help, you know, publishers know that the books are going to sell because someone's going to put a sticker on them. Um, you know, and that's, I'm not saying all of my books, but um, that, so it has been kind of different for me. That said, I've written 32 books, you know, and I've been in this industry a long time um, and getting a Newbery, getting a Coretta Scott King, getting a National Book Award, getting the Hans Christian Andersen, those awards definitely make people think, oh, this is a book I need to read. Um, but there still is so much work to do in the world of publishing in terms of really um, getting those books into classrooms, into libraries, into, into homes, because um, there are a lot of writers who still aren't represented that way. Yeah, that's very helpful. And I think if we do anything uh, in this program, I hope we will remind our, our audience that awards make a difference. Awards do make a difference. Uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask all of you um, is to what extent do you draw on your own personal experience, your own experience of your identity in your art? Is there an easy way to do that? Is there a hard way to do that? What do you think about as you make your art? Do you think about yourself? Do you think about what you want to say? Where are you in your art? And since you're there, Jacqueline, why don't you start? Um, yeah. It's, it's such a great question. I think, um, you know, I write to the, per I write the books that I would have liked to have seen in the world. And, um, and I write from this, pers this point of view of audacity, right? How dare the world not represent people who look like me and the people I love in literature. Um, so when I wrote Red at the Bone, one of the reasons I wrote that book was um, the Tulsa race massacre was one of many, many, many race massacres in this country that um, destroyed black wealth. 
And we didn't learn it. No one knew about, I mean, so few people knew about this massacre or they called it a race riot and they downplayed it. Um, and I wanted, and I had never read about it in literature. I mean, now we have the Watchmen and now coming on its hundredth anniversary, there's that, that race massacre is getting more attention. But, but I do, I, there is definitely an intentionality to my writing in terms of trying to make visible the historically invisible and, um, and trying to, um, create a world where my daughter, where people who look like us can walk through it and see themselves in all aspects of it. You know, I hear that phrase a lot. Look like me. People who look like me. What do you look like? Um, I'm amazing. You know, <laughs> hear my daughter or my son tell it. I, you know, I, I think, um, I, I feel like I represent every non-white person in this country. So, so I, look like, I look like someone who's walking through this world who has historically been invisible to the white gaze. That, not to say that I am writing for the white gaze. I am not. I am writing for the people who look like me yeah. um, so that they can have mirrors of themselves in the world. And, and it's so funny because often I'll get from white audience members like, what were you think? What did you want white people to think when they read Black? And I'm like, I'm not thinking about white people. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, and I think people are sometimes surprised to hear that, like, because to hear that we're, that they're not on our consciousness the way we are on theirs. I mean, not their consciousness, their minds. As, um, and so it's a complicated thing, but I, I see myself as, you know, I see myself as a woman. I see myself as a person of color. I see myself as an activist. I see myself you know, as a mom, I see myself as a partner. <laughs> like I, I see myself, you know, um, um, I still, even with the MacArthur, don't see myself as a genius, though <laughs> um, there are people who do, but yeah. I, I see myself as someone who is really trying to be a good ancestor, right? Trying to do the work that is going to make this world safer for people. Okay, okay. So Andrea, does that phrase ever cross your mind as an actor of people who look like me? Well, for sure. That was so beautiful. What? Um, Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, you know, it's so lovely, really. And you're, just, yeah. And what what I, I love is your, it just how um, uh, present and alive you are. It's um, it, you know, without having to, without having to um, put down anybody. It's just a, a beautiful place of acceptance and love, and I really feel that. Um, my goodness. Well, you know, look, I grew up Armenian um, in in Portland, Maine. And um, it was uh, my family's goal to assimilate. Uh, so the the I don't I don't think it's been a conscious struggle for me. I think it's um it's been kind of starting out acting was a kind of a place of survival, really. Mm -hmm. If I was going to not um, be like everybody else, and I was going to find a place where I could be different, and that was certainly in the theater and children's theater. Um, but you know, it, it's a it, it's been a long journey for me. When I started out um, in the theater, it was I would hide behind many many characters that I uh, played, and and I played many and won many awards for them. But it was really difficult for me to be myself on stage until um, about uh, twenty years. I'm seventy three now, so about twenty years ago, I uh, wrote a one woman show, and the most important thing was for me to be able to be on stage without glasses, without a wig, without uh, costumes, and really feel like I was enough, just as myself. It took a long time to feel like that. You know, um, being Armenian, um, where you know the the genocide has never been recognized to feel always like you that you weren't weren't recognized for your whole being um, has really you know I've like every Armenian I think it's um cellular that feeling of not being uh, uh, love for everything for who I am not being respected not seeing our history and not accepting that there was uh, you know the first genocide really in this country so it's it's underneath but it's present and I think when when I did this one person show I was able to really say this is who I am and so my career has kind of shifted in the last um, 20 years and I'm much more comfortable uh, um, you know playing roles that are closer to me 
I hope that answered your question. Well, what is a role closer to you? Um, that's a really great question. I, I'd say um, I, a role closer to me is how I would approach the role, not really what the role is, but how I would approach it. And what that would mean would be how can I um, use the truth of who I am in that part rather than layering it with another person's oh. truth. I and, um, I, it was, you know, difficult for me to be um, uh, uh, naked and vulnerable and um, really defenseless uh, in parts. So I've been very successful in the world of comedy, which is wonderful. And, and I'm so grateful to have had the kind of career and bring joy to people. But as I um, stopped with the layers and could and see that who I am inside is valuable, I've been able to bring um, emotions closer to me, to the parts that I play. I see, I see. So Indu, what about Jacqueline's phrase, people who look like me? Is that an issue in your art? Does that phrase, I mean, I know you're in a different country, but does that phrase literally, or the meaning of that phrase play a part in your art? Absolutely, <clears throat> absolutely. And I totally, and I, and I loved it when Jacqueline said, uh, make invisible, that is his, make this invisible that is historically invisible <clears throat> I think um, I think it's really interesting when I started it was really um, what was fascinating was that there was a real assumption or pressure of like oh the only way I could have a career was if I had a uh, started an Asian theatre company that was that was uh, uh, what I was advised when I was uh, starting um, and which of course I sort of went mm, uh, don't want to be pigeonholed because I, my identity is multifaceted like everybody's is um and then but what's been really interesting is twofold it's like I've been really I was sort of fascinated again earlier about the complexity of identities because you know um I'm sure like America but here if uh, the the identity if you were not white was very two-dimensional or, or or reductive so it was that that was a real passion um but I think what I really empathised with was the the both the immigrant experience um, uh, and how and how finding that commonality of those stories, um, regardless of how not necessarily that they had to be Asian, Afro Caribbean, or many different cultures and stuff, and and then that grew and developed into a real fascination and a passion of different cult cultures and how to find ways of putting that on stage. Okay, so yes, for all, all three of you, Jacqueline's phrase is, is meaningful and important. Um, so I wanna, I wanna drag you off into something that's important to me and that I make art about, which is hair. And I'm looking at all three of you and you all three have dark hair and I have white hair. Does my white hair, my proclamation of being old, how do I figure in people who look like me? Jacqueline. <laughs> you know, it, it's, uh, I would, your hair is amazing. <laughs> I think um, I'm finally starting to oh, just know, the color, but, but my partner um, went gray very young and is, has long, you know, corkscrew near white hair um, mm -hmm. and, and, and talks about the different perceptions she gets on the street, you know, when her hair was big and dark and black, the cat calls and the attention and, and the invisibility that comes from um, her hair turning gray and, and, and also the different kind of attention, which is your hair is a spectacular, right? You know, <laughs> the, but, but, and people seeing that as the first thing. Um, and, and I think that when I think about my existence, I mean, you know, from what you know of my work, all the ages figure into it. I mean, it's yes. always multi-generational and including the ancestors because yeah. how yeah. would we be here without them? And, um, and I think that it is, I, I think it's important to that, that we are represented at all stages of our lives, right? And at the same time, it's so interesting as I get older, you know, I'm 57 now. Um, 
and just and just coming to terms with what it means for me as who who was once an athlete and and you know super super active to not be able to run five miles the way mm. I once did and and just calling and and the even the decision, you know, when my hair started going gray and I, I like my dark hair, it's like, am I going to die? And it's like, no, I don't want to be one of those people who when I'm 102, God willing, I'm still wearing black hair, you know, yeah. like a hat. Um, so, so it is, it is such an interesting question. And I, I just, I just feel like I have a deep respect for every part of this journey because it is such a ding ding journey that we're mm -hmm. on. Mm hmm Andrea, do you dye your hair? Look, you're talking about a subject that I literally could talk about for the next <laughs> 25 minutes. You have no idea what you brought up. And how am I going to do this so succinctly? Not only do I dye my hair, up until a year ago, I used to fly to Atlanta, Georgia, from Maine, to get my hair cut. Look, I, I'm going to tell you this very, very quickly. My dad, God bless his soul could never ever see anything I did without commenting on my hair. Um, he would say, why did you, why, why would they put that wig on you? Why didn't you wear a blonde wig? And I'd say, daddy, I'm Armenian. A blonde wig in this part isn't going to work. He would always comment on my hair, never talk about what I did or how I came across. And um, I, I did a movie a few years ago called uh, Hedvig and the Angry Inch. And I was oh, really, yes. really mm -hmm. proud of it. And um, we were in a car, I'm going to try this really quickly, because it was really changed my relationship with my father. Um, he, we were in a car driving, and, um, and so we were both captive audiences. And um, I asked him what he thought of the movie. And he said, well, your hair looked good. And I said, Daddy, why do you always talk about my hair? Why can't you talk about my acting? Or why can't you talk... And then he's, his eyes filled up with tears. And he said, because I don't know anything about acting, but I know how hair should look. <laughs> and I, 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 it would, I, I understood the years that he <laughs> critiqued me, that he really didn't feel like he had any knowledge about acting, but to talk about hair. So not only does the first person I see when I do a play is the wig master. I have it in my contracts that I, I mean, you have no idea that, and I'm going to be really honest. My hair right now is yes, of course I dye my hair and it has no <laughs> highlights in it. And because I'm so effing vain, I took some um, concealer under my eyes and I drew on, as you can see before yes. this, little highlights yes. that's so brilliant, I, so brilliant. I'm insane yes. with my hair um and anyway i'm not gonna <laughs> take over this whole <laughs> conversation but you obviously are talking about something that i wish i could extricate myself from but at the same time i am trapped in um years of identity with the way my hair mm -hmm. is and the way wigs inform characters i play Right. But it looks really healthy. So <laughs> can you tell that they're little? I mean, it's crazy. I've, it's That's anyway. so brilliant. Okay. Yeah. So um, in this phrase, the complexity of identity <laughs> really, really hit home there. Now, Indu, before I ask you, I want to tell you about a stereotype that reigns in New Jersey, where I'm from, where there are a lot of people from the Indian subcontinent. And um, Indian women's Indian hair is kind of fetishized as being incredibly beautiful, which it is. But I remember when I was an undergraduate art student in Mason Gross at Rutgers, I had a fellow, a sister student uh, who was Indian American and she hated her hair because of the fetishization. Hmm. So, um, what does hair mean for you? Are you gonna go gray? Uh, tell me about your hair in your art. <laughs> oh, wow. Andrea, I love your hair. <laughs> I just want to say that. I just want to say that. God, it's so, um, it's such a personal political thing isn't it or or, or That's hair exactly our topic yeah yeah yeah, yeah no absolutely i mean into, I, I've, I've got a, um uh what do i think about my hair so um 
I've never had an issue with my hair. I've had been lucky with kind of very healthy hair and I've tried, I've done lots. I think what I was really irritated growing up was that I couldn't dye it. Do you know, you know, it's like, like loads of my friends, you know, in terms of, and you know, that all those washing dyes, I tried every one of them <laughs> and they never worked ah. because I didn't realize I had to bleach it and go to a hairdresser and all the rest of it. <laughs> so I was like, and I grew up in a, like a very small mining town where, you know, it was predominantly white. So I was just trying to sort of, hang in and I could so I could never dye my hair then when I realized I could when I realized you have to go to a hairdresser and get bleach and everything and I went through a phase I, I, I cut off all my hair went very short and I realized now is when I decided to be a director and I realized because I used to have long hair and it was uh um you know uh and I and I wanted to be taken seriously ah. and I, I didn't realize that until afterwards and I remember someone talking to me going why is it that all the female directors have very short hair and I was like no we have it and then I realized oh the moment I cut all my hair off was when I had decided that I wanted to try and become a director mm -hmm. so I had very very short cropped hair and then I just went through many different phases of trying to dye it and then I've actually gone very traditional and just grown grown it so this is the longest it's been for for years yeah Part, partly due to lockdown yeah. um, <laughs> uh, uh, and not going to a hairdresser um um i uh what do yeah i i will dye my hair <laughs> <laughs> I want to be like you now. I want to be <laughs> like you. But it's like, it's just really kind of uh, scary. So one that, yeah. I wish I, my dad was amazing because he had um, jet black hair and he was just grey at the mm -hmm. um, at the temples. And um, people thought, you know, like, I don't know if you, do you know Grecian 2000s? I don't know. It was an advert. Oh, yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, Cover your bread. Cover yeah, and, bread. And, and everyone <laughs> thought my father had dyed his hair he never had I'd wished I'd inherited those genes I don't think I have <laughs> well can I, say one thing, later. can I say something that I oh, just yeah. remembered yeah yeah when I was studying mime with Jacques Lecoq in 1970 and so it was mime he said and I've never forgotten it you know when you see clowns with different color hair the 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 one part of your body that informs people looking at you and how you feel about yourself is your hair mm -hmm. and yeah that, that your hair your hair I'm about to play a nun on something mm -hmm. and they're putting a veil around my head and I had a costume fitting yesterday and I was paralyzed for a minute because I'm like oh my god I'm not going to see my hair. Nobody's going to see my hair. What does that mean? I think it's going to be an extraordinary challenge to play this part and and uh, have my hair invisible. So I, I'm wondering what that will mean to me and how I interpret the character. So I just wanted to mm. say that. Yeah. I also I also think so you know that there's a really interesting thing about the energy in your hair, and mm. you know, like I mean, we have it in all our mythology with Samson and yeah. like you know and. Uh, but it's, yeah, what, I, I think, it, I, again, just very personally, like a few couple of years ago, I got, I developed a bald patch through stress mm. um, and like my hair just uh, fell out and it was, um, it was an autoimmune thing and it ended up being fine. But I didn't realize how much it affected me having this bald patch. And, and, and I remember talking to the doctor and she said, and she'd written a paper about women and their hair. And, you know, that, that it's such an emotional, psychological complexity. But I also think it's like, you know, when you get your hair cut and people say they feel lighter or whatever, there's such an energy mm -hmm. in your hair that yeah. I'm, I'm sure like Andrea and Jacqueline, we could, and you know, we could just talk about this for ages. It is it's true. great because it's I've never, you know, nobody's ever been, nobody brought, has ever brought that up in a conversation. So it's a fabulous, it's, I, and because it must be because you are thinking now about your own hair and how, and I'm going to ask you a question. Why did you decide to let yourself go completely gray? How did you feel about that? Well, I, I've had this hair for like two generations now ah. <laughs> for a long time. I'm married to a younger man. And um, we got married in 
our 40s um, 31 years ago as the Bank of America so helpfully tells me. Um, and at that time, I did color my gray. I did not straighten my hair. And for some reason, marrying a much younger man, so four and a half years, made, made me rethink my own um, self-fashioning as an older woman. My mother helped a lot. My mother did not cover her gray. And she told me, you have to use this special shampoo so your, your gray doesn't go yellow. She was very helpful in many, many ways. But um, I stopped straightening my hair um, two generations ago. And I thought, if I don't straighten my hair, you know, why should I color my hair? So um, I have experienced it as a real um, freeing from, you could say freeing from the male gaze, but I think women uh, police each other as much or maybe even more as men mm -hmm. when it comes to body. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I got there. But, you know, this, our energy around this question, oh, let, let me just say one more thing. I got into talking about hair when I was last at McDowell, which was last winter, you know, November, December, when I made a, a big wall piece on ancient hair because the white nationalists um, are carrying on about the genius of white people and they go back to antiquity and they show all this ancient statuary as their, their ancestors. And I said, well, look, if you look at those, that statuary, it's got hair that's not German hair. You know, it's not English hair. It's Mediterranean hair. And some of it is downright African hair. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got into really paying attention to hair. But let me, let me just throw this back at the three of you. So we've had a really energized conversation about hair. Would you play a part, Andrea, in which hair is, is a theme? Jacqueline, would you write a novel in which a main character deals with her hair going gray? Bindu, have you ever uh, produced or even commissioned a play about a woman talking about her hair, Indu? Yeah, I mean, like it's really interesting because um, a couple of, um, I did an adaptation of Zadie Smith's White Teeth and there's oh, a yeah. whole section um, about um, <clears throat> hair and her going to the hairdresser and straightening it and stuff like that. And we made that into a really big moment in the, the adaptation and a whole number around what you do with black and particularly around black and the politics of black hair. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I've always, I mean, since quite early on, I, re I remember I was when I was an assistant director, there was a, a show by a group of black women who, and there was this whole, it was a comedy sketch show. And there was this whole sequence about them putting towels around their hair and pretending to have long uh, mm -hmm. uh, blonde and apparently, you know, the, uh, so it's always it's it's been something that um, and I, I think I mentioned to you, I did a play called The House That Will Not Stand that was set in uh, New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And there was this horrific moment where the, mo the mother cuts the daughter's hair in rage. Mm. Uh, and um, so it's, it's, it's I've always found it, it. I think it's a potent uh, theatrical image um, that I have used. And I, I mean, what, uh, a novel that uh, I loved was Americana, which again has lots of description and talking about hair and, and, and stuff like that. So I, I yes, I, I think, because I think in art, using something that's so common or so um, um, universal, like, attitudes to hair but that has this politics and this potency can be a really brilliant um intersection of how to how to get the politics out of something so universal mm -hmm. and um every day on mm -hmm. one hand mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jacqueline would you write a novel in which a cat <laughs> deals with her gray hair you know it's interesting it would um have to that wouldn't be the only theme, right? Because as Indu said, it's it's so much bigger. It's political, it's historical, it's ancestral. Um, so 
Yeah, I would. I've written about hair a lot. I mean, Brown Girl Dreaming, I talk about sitting in the kitchen and getting the towel around, getting the hair straightened, you know, and I think that there are so many, like we've just talked about so, so many bigger themes around that. And yes, I would write it because I, you know, I love writing anything, but, um, but it would, it would be more about what it means, you know, the construct of hair, right? Everything from, do we decide to wear it natural or do we decide to relax it or straighten it or braid it or extend it? Like there's, it's such a complicated conversation that going gray seems almost oversimplifying it, right? Just that choice to go gray, it, 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 you know, individually it's huge. But when we think about literature, characters are bigger than real life, as you know, as a writer. So it would have to be, it would have to be layered in a lot of other stuff for me to stay interested in it. Cause I just know so many people with gray hair and it's not, it, it's not a conversation. I mean, the conversation is what are you going to do with that gray hair? Like, are you going to lock it? Are you going to wear it, you know, just out? Are you, you know, how do you wash it? Do you use silk and silver? Do you use this? Like all of that stuff is much more interesting to me. That's because you're younger. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. It'll be interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, no problem with the marketplace in this kind of a topic uh, that gets into some of the complexities of identity. Easy to sell, easy to publish, easy to produce, uh, easy to play. In terms of, in terms of the like thought getting about- Getting it out, getting it out. Some, uh, getting which thing out, about the aging, art. about- the, this, this, this novel that you're going to write uh, <laughs> <laughs> centered on somebody going gray and, mm -hmm. and really delving into the intricacies of mm -hmm. going gray, um, you know, getting old, basically. Uh -huh. Are you going to have trouble selling that so that see, it can see the light of day? You know, it, it, I think that's such a great question, Nell. And I do think that that's where I see the pushback in our country is around representing aging, you know? Uh -huh. and, um, and the fact that pe the, it, people say that the young people are not interested in it, right? So it is the Oscar So White, it is um, SALT, right? It is these organizations that are not letting that narrative, in, like cutting that narrative off before it even has breath. Um, and, and so even when, I remember there was a book many, many years ago and it was about an older couple in a relationship and publishers were so stunned by it becoming a, a New York Times bestseller, right? Because, and, and then there were a couple of books that came along similar to that. They weren't as well written and that's why they didn't sell. But what the narrative becomes, right, is that kind of story doesn't sell. Mm -hmm. um, so so it is it is interesting. I'm trying to think of the books that are on the market now that are doing really well that are about relationships or aging. And I'm not, I'm not thinking, but mm -hmm. I don't. I'm not reading a lot of fiction right now. Well, so. I just read Monogamy and um, the characters do get in, into age, uh, into mm. the 50s, but, um, so, but it's a, a long uh, stretch over their, their, their marriage. Um, but the issue I've, I've wanted us to touch on and which you've started us with is um, our dealing with the complexities of our identity, our personal identity, and perhaps wanting to make those into art and then getting that art into the marketplace. So, you know, for many, many years, it was thought that black stuff wouldn't sell. And then it somehow it got out, uh, perhaps because it's a supported publisher said, I'm gonna put this up for some awards. And lo and behold, it sold. Um, Andrea, you've had an experience with um, a piece that you wrote that seemed not likely to sell because it was nonfiction. It was about you. I'm, I'm not sure what, yeah. that, what would that be? I, I don't know the name of it. I don't know if I ever learned the name of it, but uh, being a brilliant actor was one thing, but uh, playing yourself was something else that was not seen as marketable. Hmm. I, I'm not sure I know what the what that 
reference is, I, I certainly have had experience um, playing older people and mm-hmm. feeling stereo and feeling a stereotype. I'm going to talk about the hair again. Yeah. I you know, just did a Christmas Carol on Broadway, the London production, actually, that Matthew Warch just did. And um, I played the ghost of Christmas past and Campbell Brown, the extraordinary wig, I, I worship him, wig maker, mm-hmm. wanted to put me in white hair. And I said, Campbell, I, I don't, can't I play the ghost of Christmas past with kind of faded red hair? Does it have to be a stereotype of mm-hmm. white hair? And he said, no, it doesn't. So I was able to embody the part without having to be stereotypically white because I'm older. And the same thing applied with a, a part that I did in Pippin, where she was an older woman and she was singing, it's time to start living. And Irene Ryan played it many years ago in a cameo. And it was all this kind of stereotype about being old and all crotchety. I said, well, well, I'm that age. Why I don't feel that way. Why can't I play the part as my age? And why can't I make it interesting and entertaining? Why does age have to be the first first part of the uh, the performance? Why does that? So I've tried to resist that. Now I try to n- not be penned in by my age and hope that the buoyancy and um, I, I don't know, enthusiasm and effervescence that I have as somebody mm-hmm. 73 will, will come through and that I don't have to be mm-hmm. suppressed by being older. I hope that parts will come still. Mm-hmm. I think it's much more mm-hmm. difficult, but I'm mm-hmm. determined to yes. not let it, um, <laughs> I'm determined to not let it uh, stop yeah. me or dissuade, dissuade me. Yeah. Indu, have you done, um, have you produced uh, plays in which you see yourself? Oh, um, I don't think I've consciously done that because I think I, 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 um, I've produced, I've, I've directed plays that are closer to home, to my experience, but rarely. Um, I'm more interested in like sort of stretching to that other experience or trying to uh, uh, identify that story. Um, I think it's, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have. I think it's also, it's, I mean, just to sort of, just to go back to sort of what you were earlier asking about, mm-hmm stories that sell or marketable and I I kind of think I kind of think it's dependent on who the gatekeepers are yeah. uh, in and and that's been my experience and um, I, I think it was really interesting I was trying to get a play on as a freelance theatre director which was about the uh, a new play uh, uh, about Ira Aldridge the first black mm-hmm. actor uh, in Covent Garden a Shakespearean actor mm-hmm. um, a new play written uh, by Lalita Chakrabarti and I couldn't get it on and it took me being an artistic director when I became an artistic director I could then program that play and and so my lesson in that and the the real call I've been calling in our industry is like just have the have a, a variety and a diversity in which I mean also in terms of gender and class and uh sexuality and everything as as the gatekeepers in charge because then that you'll you'll get a variety of choices Mm -hmm. but the other stumbling block 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 I or the other thing I've really witnessed as an artistic director is I can see the difference about how the press Mm -hmm. will even engage with a show um so by that I you know I can and we've and and I've spoken about this publicly so it's not Um, nothing new but it's just like I can see the difference of press interest even just I'm not even talking about critical reviews I'm talking about all the pieces you need beforehand to sell the tickets to market the shows I can see the difference when the show is by a writer of color and when the writer is white um and so my call to arms in our industry is that it's the whole ecology has to be examined it's not just certain sections of it mm-hmm. um you know so it's it, it it's not that the good stories are there that people might want to come and see it's who who all the various facets who are the gatekeepers that stop mm-hmm. the potential success marketing that 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 information being reached out to an audience about mm-hmm. pieces of work I'm going to ask you a question that just occurred to me as you were talking. Um, McDowell recently did a a panel with journalists 
And one of the issues that I would have hoped they talked about, but they didn't, was the drying up of, of journalistic outlets, uh, which I suppose is happening in the UK, and I mean, it's, it's terrible here. What, what does that mean for you, getting the word out on your book? When I think it's really dangerous because, yes, we're having that. A lot of arts coverage is being cut in mm -hmm. a, a, a lot of papers. And, um, and also, not only that, with the COVID and our sector mm -hmm. sort of being so reduced, it's going to be even worse. Um, yeah, it really, really worries me because I think, I think we're entering, we're going to go into a time in what our recovery is going to be out of this, and um, uh, particularly in in theatre where we need the audiences, where we need to be live. The yeah. live sort of sector is we're we're already sort of hemorrhaging money left, right, and centre. Mm -hmm. The need to come back um, is. I'm, I fear, deeply fear, is that we're going to become even more risk adverse uh, and conservative with a small c in our taste and our programming and our producing of work because of all those reasons. There's less arts coverage. Who are the reviews that the editors are going to be pushing their reviewers and their journalists to, mm -hmm. to do the big glamorous things? What are the big glamorous things, the things with names? What are names? You know, there's all going to be these kind of... Uh, um, conditions and uh uh because you know we're fighting for our livelihood we're fighting for our survival and for you know for me and the board at, at kiln we're, we're we what, what we've really sort of uh, sort of come to terms with in this time is actually to stay on mission is going to be the biggest thing we can do to and our mission is unheard voices being part of the mainstream to mm -hmm. be able to stay on that and to be able to uh, be robust and survive in that is going to be really, mm -hmm. is going to be tough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you take to uh, distributing flyers and handbills uh, in the, as they did in the olden days? Yeah, but I don't think that's as good as the, the <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's going it, to, word of mouth is the best Mm -hmm. is the best thing and it's how do you get I mean they say that that I mean I'm, I'm not an expert marketing person but they say that there's like people need to see something three or four times mm -hmm. before they'll buy a ticket you know whether they see a poster whether they see a handbill whether they see something on the internet you know they need to sort of see it and especially if you're doing new writing you know if you're doing new work mm -hmm. you, you need to convince people to come come in mm -hmm. but I think what the main thing is for a lot of theatres is uh, that we're going to be local we're going to be really embedded even more in our community. Mm -hmm. uh, Jacqueline, um, Indu ended with be local, be more embedded in the community. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have uh, an arts residency, which is kind of the, the uh, example of being local because you're creating your own community. Uh, is part of that uh, a response to the drying up of, say, reviewers and, and the paucity of, of good journalism? Or are you uh, answering to other needs? Uh, it's a combination. I think part of Baldwin is about creating community. I think um, more and more, I came up in a very isolated community until I got to McDowell and started meeting composers and writers and um, visual artists. But the thing I find, found was that there was a lot of explaining because often I was one of two people of color, three people of color. So Baldwin is, you know, a residency for BIPOC artists, visual artists, writers, and composers where we don't have to explain, right? You know, it's just the conversation is just about our work. And so that that that's what it was born of, really trying to come create this safe space for mm -hmm. um, BIPOC artists to gather, perform, share work, get work out there, share mm -hmm. work with the public. So, mm -hmm. so that's how I start. That, that's where it began. But each of your artists performs that um, um, word of mouth for other artists. Yes, so exactly. In, in many ways, that's also this kind of... Uh, handing out of flyers about other it's, people's work. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And it's safer because you don't have to touch the flyers in the age of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
<laughs> right. But yeah, I do. I do rely a lot on social media on word of mouth. And, you know, we have a website, but vetting people, I mean, in the same way that McDowell asked, you know, basically, are you a nice person? Can you get along with other people? Because <laughs> yes, yes. um, you're bringing them onto the land and giving mm -hmm. them a place and three meals a day, and you really want it to be safe for all artists. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you have questions about getting your work out, Andrea? Uh, challenges of getting your work out, I guess I would say, particularly in this time. I think that the challenges right now are um, age related, because mm -hmm. and by the time this pandemic ends, I'll even be older. Yeah. And also parts that I normally would be cast in are now uh, primarily going to go to people of color. That's that's how um, they, uh, it, which is fabulous, but also not particularly. It just it, it means that the pool is smaller. I think. What and, kind of parts are you talking about? Oh my gosh! I, you know, I don't know what would I what would I be playing on television or film. I, I mean. I, I don't know what a, a professor, a professor <laughs> or someplace. A, professor. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a professor, um, a, a doctor, a, a, a chairman of the board, um, a best friend, whatever, whatever parts I would play because I'm now older. Um, and uh, there are just there are fewer. Here's the deal. There are fewer parts. There are fewer opportunities. Mm -hmm. But I am not going to let that um you know, get me down. I, I just, I believe that talent, um, I hope <laughs> that mm -hmm. talent in the long run um, wins. And I hope that there'll be now a large, maybe more parts for everybody so that it's not right. just restricted to, you know, because she's that age, she plays that right, part. Right, right. I hope what this means where we are right now mm -hmm. with everything that's going on is that people will think outside the box and there'll mm -hmm. be parts for more people of all uh, genders, races, everything, everything. So yeah. that's what I'm hopeful for. If, if mm -hmm. you and Indu were in the same world, an actor and uh, a creative director, what part would you ask Indu to let you play? Indu, what part would you say, <laughs> Andrea, you're perfect for this? That's a great question. Great question. Mm -hmm. Well, Andy, you you deal primarily with new works, right? Yeah. So I'm not going to know what those parts are, but I'll be good for every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Listen, you know, I think in England, actually, you do a much better job of diversity and um, I, for all the plays that I've seen in London. Um so I, I think it's we're not as open here in the United States. And uh, so I probably should come to London. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Andrea. Yeah, I think, we're. you know, it's I mean, like, listen, I, you know, I, I think Andrea could play a whole range of different things. You know, it's not, oh, she's perfect for this. I'd like to see what I'm always interested. I love casting people in unexpected ways in ways that, you know, I love that that is not what they are expected to, you know, to do. So that, I mean, that's a, but I just, just on a, I'm, I'm probably going to be the downer on Andrea's optimism, <laughs> the, the <laughs> pessimism of the future. I feel that we're really an interesting moment. And in the sense of, in terms of casting, it's like we, you know, we're asking and I under absolutely understand the politics because we need to sort of we need to get the scales right. But we're I can see this movement of asking absolute specificity to play people to actually be that to in order to play the part. I know that's uh, that, that, really that, happening that, for sure. That's really that's um and and where and and it goes against the 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 tension. The tension is like we're all artists and we can do what we want to do and we can we can play you know Andrew can play a man as well as a, a, a woman as well you know we, we can be comedians we we transform on stage we're shamanic on the on the stage um but the problem is it's because there's been an inequality and a unbalance for centuries that is 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 asking for authenticity now but yeah it's um it's a it's a worrying I can't wait till we're all 
allowed to be artists first and foremost mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um uh rather than politicians or to you know or mm -hmm. having to uh justify uh, talk about you know that the 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 the, the strike the, the battle is to be or there to be an equality of opportunity where we're artists first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As though being an artist isn't hard enough. You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Jacqueline, I was going to hand you, we have one minute and I want you to say a few words to something that Indu said. Be that to play the part. Say that, be that to play the part. Right. Um, I, I, well, I, that's a hard one. I think the part we're playing right here in our four squares is so eye-opening and brilliant <laughs> and um, thoughtful. That and and I hope um, the part that both countries play is one that really takes into account what so many of us as artists, as creative directors, um, are trying to get people to understand that there is room for all of our voices and stories and that they, you know, whether or not they make a lot of money, which they probably will, they're, it, it's bigger than that. It's more important than that. It's, it's, it's um, older and deeper and longer than that. So um, I think that's what we're all just trying to say to, you know, get rid of the qualifiers and, and let the art live. Perfect, eloquent last words. Let the art live. What a great way to end. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Beautiful, y'all. Thank you. Thank you.